as you can see, we've, I've titled today's message, Words of Thankfulness and Encouragement. And we're going to be in, we're going to be beginning 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 this week. But uh, before I begin, let me pray and ask the Lord to, to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you with hearts of thankfulness, uh, hearts of humbleness, Lord, to just thank you for all you've done. Um, with each and every one of us, Lord, as a church as well, we know that you are working and will continue to work. Lord, we know you have us here for a reason and purpose, and we will continue to fulfill our calling, Lord, as long as you want us to. And we're thankful that we are united in one mind and one heart, Lord, and we, you know, it, it really does just give me, as a pastor here, a heart of joy. Um, I just ask now that you, as we begin this new book, the second letter of Thessalonians, that you will speak powerfully through your word, that it will change lives, marriages, hearts, Lord, that it will just go out there and, and, and do its work it's meant to do. Move all distractions, Lord. Keep us safe here. Lord, and may we just forget about everything else and just now sit at your feet and hear what you have to say, your word. <coughs> Fill this room with your spirit. We look forward to hearing from you now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so as I mentioned just a bit ago, um, we, last time we were here doing our verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study, we finished the first letter of Thessalon the first, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. And... If you weren't with us, I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the things that were covered in that letter. Um, a few points that Paul wrote about and that we covered and studied. And, and here are just a few of those points. Salvation is the result of divine election and is ultimately the work of God. Sanctification is the goal of our salvation. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the finish line for people's faith in Jesus. Suffering for the sake of Christ is part of the normal Christian life. The scriptures are essential for the spiritual health and growth of the church. And grace is the great common denominator of the Christian life. Again, those were just some points that were covered in the first letter of Thessalonians. There were many more, but again, if you want to hear those messages, um, I encourage you to check out our website, our YouTube page, and our um, YouTube, our YouTube, SoundCloud, and and I Apple Podcasts. So now, as we begin this second letter to the Thessalonians, I want to briefly cover some important background information about this letter. I did do a thorough um, background, a uh, thorough study on the background of this letter uh, before I began First Thessalonians. And if you want to get a thorough um, study of that, I have it in that YouTube, in our YouTube study. Well, like the first letter, the second claims the second letter claims to have been written by Paul under, again, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, God used Paul as his instrument to write this epistle. Most scholars agree that this letter was possibly written a few months or even weeks after the first one. Some even say possibly a year after the first letter. And if this is the case, it would date this letter in the early 50s, probably uh, AD 50 or AD 51. Paul's purpose for writing the second letter was in response to some recent news he had heard 
regarding the believers in Thessalonica. It seems that some of them, some of the things that he had written about in his first letter may have been misunderstood and had caused some problems there. And so here he writes this second letter as a short follow-up for three principal reasons. To encourage those who were being persecuted. To clarify and explain their understanding of the Lord's second coming. And to correct and advise those who were using the second coming as an excuse to be idle and not work. Now, in the process of clarifying misunderstandings of the Lord's return, Paul shows believers that this doctrine gives us true hope, a hope that will encourage us in difficult times and will motivate us to live responsibly for Jesus until he comes back. So here's the thing, church. Discipline... And self-control are two qualities that quickly slip away in a society that is so focused on the material. When this happens, people have a tendency to forget the spiritual realities that should dictate their lives. Paul knew. But Paul knew that hope in Christ would encourage perseverance, perseverance in godly living. So as we go through the words of 2 Thessalonians during the next few weeks, allow them to rekindle your hope and fan that flame and fan that flame of that burning desire to live in God-honoring industrious ways. So now that you have a little bit of an insight regarding this second letter, the section we're going to be covering today, this first chapter, Paul will begin with the Thessalonians' most pressing need, the persecution they they were experiencing because of their faith. In this first chapter, Paul will share three encouragements with his suffering saints. And once again, I've titled this message, Words of Thankfulness and Encouragement. So let's read the first part of this letter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. The Word of God says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, since your faith is flourishing and the love each each one of you has for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. It is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you will be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you are also suffering, since it is just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us. This will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels when he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who do not know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. On that day, when he comes to be glorified by his saints, when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at by all those who, are, who have believed because our testimony among you was believed. And I'll stop there. Let 
As I mentioned just a bit ago, in this chapter, Paul shares three encouragements. The first two are found in the verses that we just read, and then the third is found in the last two verses I'll be covering in just a bit. But before he shares that first encouragement, Paul begins this letter with his typical introduction. He names the same three men mentioned in that first chapter, in that first letter, and also address this, it's also addressed the same sem- assembly of Christians. Now notice that the church is described as being in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This here is important because as in so many places in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is placed on an equal level with God the Father. Then in verse 2, Paul greets his readers by reminding them that they were recipients of God's grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace, in case uh, some of you may not know, grace is God's unmerited favor which he freely bestows on anyone, on everyone who accepts Jesus Jesus Christ's substitutionary work for them on the cross by faith. See, God gives the opposite of what man deserves. Blessing instead of judgment. This, my friends, is the grace of God. Now, peace is the cessation of hostility which has, result, which, has resulted, which has resulted from Christ's death. God and people can be reconciled because of the debt, the debt of human sin that has been pay, paid by Christ. So as a Christian, you not only have peace with God through the death of Jesus Christ, but you also experience the peace of God as a result of Christ's work. Right, that was that quick salutation there in the first two verses. Now, it's in verses 3 and 4 that we see the character of, the reasons for, and the consequences of the apostles' first encouragement. The encouragement of praise. In the beginning of his first letter, Paul told the believers at Thessalonica, in Thessalonica, we always thank God for all of you, making mention, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. In his first letter, he mentioned several reasons he and his fellow missionaries were regularly thanking God for them. Well, here in verse 3, Paul starts off by confirming two reasons they had to thank God on their behalf and why he felt it was right for them to do so. First, he states that he's thankful because their faith is flourishing. Their faith is flourishing in spite of the trials and persecutions that they were facing. The faith of those believers was growing at an astonishing rate, which is the very thing. If you look back in the first letter again, chapter 3, verse 10, which is the very thing that he said he was praying for there in that verse. Similarly, as Christians, our faith, your faith, should keep flourishing throughout your entire lives. In other words, as a believer, you should trust God more consistently and extensively as you mature, as you grow in Christ. Your faith should flourish. You see, faith in God isn't a static thing. Since Since it's a trust in a person it's either increasing 
or decreasing? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. Is my faith flourishing? Is it growing? Or is it decreasing? And then once you're honest with yourself and asking that question, if it's decreasing, you've got to ask the next question, question, which is why. But here's what it comes down to. A flourishing faith, a flourishing faith indicates a growing Christian. So, not only was their faith flourishing, Paul also states another reason. He just had to thank God for them. The love each one of you has for one another is increasing. This was also something he said it was praying for in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And there he wrote, And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for, and for everyone, just as we do for you. Now, if you read James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it tells us there that genuine faith in God is always accompanied by love for others. So to put it simply, my friends, faith is the root. Love is the fruit. Faith is the root. Love is the fruit. Both faith and love were growing in that church like a well-fertilized plant. There's one other thing I want you to, I wanted to point out about this verse. If you look at the first verse of the first letter, Paul had commended their work of faith, labor, the labor of love and patience of hope. Here, there, here though, he only commends their faith and love. Well, why? Well, as we'll soon see, they had lost their hope because they were no longer living for Jesus' return. See, even though the three, faith, hope, and love, the greatest is love. All three elements, though, are essential because it's faith and hope that allow us to love. Let me repeat that. All three elements are essential because it's faith and hope that allow us to love. How is that, you may be asking. Well, I'd be ashamed to love if I were hung up, hung up over my past sins. But faith tells me my past failures were totally cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I'd also be afraid to love if I were worried about the future. But hope tells me that he's coming again. And so there's no need to fear. Similarly, the hope that is ours in Christ leads us to love one another. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, Paul tells this to the Colossian believers. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. The Colossian Christians loved their fellow believers, Paul says, because they knew they had a glorious hope awaiting for them in heaven. They knew they would be spending eternity in the presence of Christ. And this hope, it freed them. It freed them to, to give of their time and of their possessions. And perhaps, just maybe, even their lives to serve their fellow believers. And so the point is this. Faith and hope are, in one sense, means to an even greater end. 
without which they would be incomplete. They transform us so that our lives overflow with Christ-like love. Well, he goes on to say in verse 4, that because of such good growth, the apostles frequently spoke with justifiable pride to other churches about the Thessalonians. In particular, their perseverance in the midst of persecutions and afflictions. The Thessalonians didn't react to discomfort the way many Christians do by running away from their uncomfortable situations. No, not at all. Instead, they viewed their circumstances as God's will and determined to brace up under the pressure. Now, I'm not saying that what happened last week is a big persecution or a huge trial like these Thessalonians were experiencing, but that could have been a major setback and it could have just completely you know, deflated a lot of people. But understood, I understood, and many of you probably understood as well that we can't run away from uncomfortable situations. We have to keep going. We have to brace up under the pressure. So if that's what you're experiencing, you're experiencing, experiencing tough times, you're being made fun of because of your faith, you're probably going to lose your job, or you may lose friends, or you may, whatever it may be. Don't run away. Buckle up. This is what the Christian life is all about. If it's not now, it's going to happen eventually. It's going to happen again. You have to go head on. Trust Christ. Hold on to him. Well, this church here, their attitude wasn't to endure by force of their own strength, however. They had faith in God. They looked to him for grace sufficient to bear and accepted their circumstances as conditions which he was allowing for his glory. They were patiently enduring persecutions from enemies of the gospel who were hostile towards them. The afflictions they were undergoing, undergoing were painful circumstances that came from Jewish and Gentile acquaintances, friends, family, people they looked up to, people they loved and cared about. Yet, in spite of them all, the Thessalonians kept standing strong and stable in their faith. During World War II, when enemy armies invaded North Africa, the missionaries had to flee, and there was great concern over the churches left behind. But when the war ended and the missionaries returned, they discovered, they discovered strong and thriving churches. See, the sufferings of war purified the church and help strengthen the faith of true believers. What an encouragement. What an encouragement this was for the churches of the free world. And what an encouragement it ought to be for us as well. Regardless of what's going on, what happens here in America or elsewhere, the church continue to grow and strive and flourish because it's the Lord's church. It's God's church. It's the bride of Jesus. And until the day comes when he takes the church from here at the rapture, it's going to continue to flourish. Nothing will ever stop it. Nothing will ever overcome it. 
we, as Christians, as church members, we'll walk, we can walk away. We have the church uh, choice of, of walking away and have that attitude of self-defeat. But the church itself never will. It'll never be defeated. All right, so again, in verses 4 and 5, Paul gave an encouragement of praise. Now, in verses 5 through 10, Paul shared a second encouragement, the encouragement of promise, the encouragement of promise. The present experiences of the Thessalonians, Paul pointed out to them by way of encouragement, illustrated it illustrated the righteous judgment of God, meaning God is just. When God would judge the Thessalonians, he says there, they would be counted worthy of God's kingdom. Here's the thing. Endurance in trials doesn't make one worthy of heaven. One doesn't earn heaven by suffering, but endurance in trials does demonstrate, does demonstrate one's worthiness. A Christian is made worthy. Let me emphasize that again. A Christian is made worthy by God's grace, which they receive as a free gift by faith in Jesus Christ. Our trials as Christians expose what is there already. And since the character that emerges, and since the character that emerges through the fire of testing is God given, God receives all the glory. The grace of God, my friends, makes it possible for a Christian to withstand the fires of human experience, which destroy, it will only destroy non-Christians. But again, a Christian, it may, God's grace makes it possible for a Christian to withstand the fires of human experience, which again is a Christian's only claim of being worthy of God's kingdom. Now, the purpose of the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians' sufferings was to bring glory to God by manifesting His grace in the way they bore up under trials. Their suffering demonstrated that they were considered worthy of God's kingdom. In another sense, they were suffering as soldiers of Christ. Those of you who have been to combat, that have been out, out of country and have gone through war, no, it's not easy. There's all kinds of suffering going on there. Again, it's to bring, the suffering as Christians is to bring glory to God. Well, Paul then explained in verse 6 how the Thessalonians' suffering demonstrated the justice of God. He first stated the great truth taught from Genesis through Revelation. God is just, my friends. God is just. God will balance the scales of justice by repaying with affliction those who afflict the Thessalonians. On the other hand, we see in verse 7 that God will give relief from the tensions of trials to those who are afflicted by their enemies. The Thessalonians, the apostles, and every Christian who share in these pressures can look forward to this as well. Relief, my friends, will come, true relief will come at the revelation 
of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. At that time, the Lord Jesus will punish two classes of people. I don't know if you noticed that there. Two classes of people. Those who don't know God and those who don't obey the gospel. Who do you think is going to be worse off? The latter. The guilt of those in the second group will be greater because their privilege is greater. See, God's judgment is perfectly just. Willful rejection of God's revelation spurns God. If you know the truth, what God did, what Jesus did on the cross for you, and you purposely, willfully reject it, I, I wouldn't want to see the kind of judgment God's going to bestow on you. Walking away from God's free gift and saying no. Or even saying, even at one time saying yes and then willfully, willfully rejecting and walking away from that. Willfully sinning. Willfully doing the things you know you shouldn't be doing that Christ says you have to stay away from and yet you still do it willfully, there will be a tough, tougher punishment for you. The destruction, we're told in verse 9, will befall both groups. They will pay the penalty for their rejection of God's grace, They'll experience endless or eternal destruction. The punishment of the wicked will neither be temporary nor will it be annihilation, but it will continue throughout eternity, and those being punished will be conscious. They will know, they will feel it. Definitely, 100%. Feel that punishment. Again, there is no annihilation of death. And that suffering isn't temporary. There is no, no purgatory. It is eternal death as opposed to eternal life. The nature of the destruction is explained in the next phrase. Eternal separation from the Lord's presence. Friends, church, right now, while we're here, while we're alive in this church age, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're disobedient, whether you're Satan worshiper, whether you're like, you know, full on sin, we still, all of us still have are being bestowed a level of grace. He still blesses. He still loves. Holy Spirit is still here. It's what con convicts the world of sin. But one day, when you're eternally separated from Him, you're completely separated. All of God's grace, all those blessings will never, ever be there again. You will never feel those blessings. All there will be is eternal suffering. On the other hand, being in the Lord's presence will make heaven, heaven. A Christian's hope is to see and be with the Lord. The judgment of unbelievers is to be eternally inaccessible to his presence. His glorious strength is the visible splendor of the Lord's presence. The Lord's power will be manifested in majestic display. Unbelievers, though, will be forever shut out from the Lord's presence and his power. 
Lastly, in verse 10, Paul explains that his judgment will take place when the Lord comes back to earth and be glorified through the lives of believers whom he has transformed by making saints out of sinners. Now, this isn't the rapture, for no judgment accompanies the rapture. Instead, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ in power and great glory when he will set up his earthly kingdom. At his return, he will destroy the Armageddon armies gathered against him, and he will judge the living Jews and the living Gentiles. These judgments are the ones described there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. The exact date, again, of his return isn't given, of course. But it will be a day of judgment for the lost and a day of glory and marveling and complete marveling for believers. Christ, I, I'm so looking forward to that day. Christ will be glorified in, not by his saints. That is, his glory his glory, Jesus' glory will be mirrored, mirrored in them. Christians will marvel in that they will admire their Lord for what he has done in them. All believers will marvel, not just those living on earth and those resurrected when Christ returns, but those who return to earth with him, those who have been caught up to be with the Lord at the rapture. Now some cultists have tried to dilute the meaning of eternal destruction saying it means either temporary suffering or total annihilation. But both ideas are false. The phrase means eternal judgment, no matter how men try to twist it or avoid it. It is eternal judgment. All right, so we just saw how Paul encouraged his friends with praise and promise. Well, in the last two verses, he shares a third encouragement. So if you still have your Bibles open, let's read those last two verses of chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. For this reason, God sends them a strong... I'm sorry, that was chapter 2. Um... Verse 11, in view of this, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you and you by him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The preceding revelation, what Paul had just said, moved Paul to pray for his Thessalonian brothers and sisters that they might have lifestyles that were consistent with their calling and their destiny. Paul writes in verse 11 that he and his colleagues regularly prayed for the Thessalonians because their spiritual welfare it was always on the apostles' hearts. What did he pray for? What did they pray for? They prayed, they prayed that their God, the apostles and the Thessalonians, God, would reckon or declare the readers worthy of the calling they'd received. What was that calling? to come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. To come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the calling of every believer. Of every single person to come to faith. To come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul consistently made what God has done for believers the basis of his appeals for them to lead lives in keeping with their destiny. 
This shows us that as Christians, we don't live worthily in order to obtain salvation, but rather we live worthily because we've been granted salvation. Let me repeat that. As Christians, we don't live worthily, not worthily, but worthily, in order to obtain salvation, but rather we live worthily because we've been granted salvation. A second request was that God would fulfill every desire of theirs to do good and that their work will be motivated by their faith in God. Both motives and actions, he clarifies, have their source in God and are accomplished by his power. In the final verse, he states that the ultimate purpose of his prayer is the glory of God. Specifically, it was that God's glory be manifested in and through the Thessalonians, both immediately and at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When this happens, the vessels that manifest the glory of God are themselves glorified by association with him. See that? You glorify God. You yourselves are glorified by association with God. In the Bible, the name stands for a person named, his character, conduct, reputation, and everything else about him. And so in praying this, Paul was asking that God would fully glorify Jesus Christ in these saints. And us as saints as well. Brother and sister in Christ. Those of you who have trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, those of you who are believers, Jesus Christ will be glorified in his saints when we, when we return with him. However, the fact is, he should be glorified right now. He should be glorified in our lives right now, today. In almost every society, in almost every area of society, we see it a lot in social media, news, magazines, almost everywhere. The name of Jesus is blasphemed. But as believers, as Christians, we ought to bless his name at every opportunity and seek to glorify it. Do you do that? When you hear all the horrible things being said about Jesus, how he's still to this day being mocked, ridiculed, when the good news, the gospel is being smeared or do you, what, what's your response? Do you say, you know what? Jesus is Lord. He changed my life. He, I glorify him. I praise him. If you were to be interviewed on TV, publicly live, and you were asked, what are your thoughts and opinions about Jesus? Will you be the kind of person that says no comment? Or will you say, glory be to God? Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I no longer have to suffer the wrath, God, the wrath of death. I don't have to suffer uh, death anymore. I'm free. I'm forgiven. that be your response? It ought to be. Bless the name of Jesus and seek to glorify it. The amazing thing is, is that the believer who glorifies Christ is likewise glorified in Christ. 
Here's what that verse says in the NIV. Glorified in you and you in him. Now, how could this be done? Again, verse 12, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, grace and glory go together as do suffering and glory. As we receive his grace, we reveal his glory. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 22, it says, There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Friends, there is no rest for the wicked. But guess what? There is no rest for those who trust Christ and seek to live for his glory. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. Friends, there is no rest for the wicked. But guess what? There is rest. There is rest for those who trust Christ and seek to live for his glory. I needed to make that clarification because I misread that. So, again, I hope you understood that and it's clear. My friends, fellow Christian, again, if you trusted in Christ, the best, the best is yet to come. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 tells us this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So once again, let me tell you, my fellow believer, if you're suffering, if you're going through trials, if you're going through the hard times, the best is yet to come. This isn't it. What you're going through is, isn't, isn't the finality. If you endure, if you hold on to Christ, it's going to make you stronger. It's going, to, it's going to help you grow in your faith. But you have to hold on. Don't give up. There's a reason and purpose behind it. So again, hold on to him. Glorify him. Let me reiterate once more the three promises Paul made, or the three uh, encourage, encouraging words Paul made in these 12 verses, 13 verses that we read. First of all, he gave an encouragement of praise. He then gave an encouragement, a promise. Then he gave a third encouragement. Encouragement of living worthily. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as I close this message, I hope these words have brought encouragement for you as well. To live a life for Him. To live a life that will glorify Him. Praise Him. Yes, we're going to go through some hard times. You, as, an in, as a Christian, will go through some difficult times. And like I said, it's not the end. We ought to encourage one another. We ought to pray for one another. We ought to thank God for one another, just as Paul is doing here. I know that I do. As, as I think of all of you, now, again, when I think of all of you, it's all like at different times of the day, throughout different times of the week. You guys pop up in my mind and, you know, I'm like, Lord, I pray that you bless them. It may not be like a full-on long prayer. For some it is. For some it's just, Lord, 
I know you put them in my heart and mind, and I pray that you will bless them and be with them. But yeah, you know, I have to regularly pray for one. If someone does, it happens the same to you. If someone pops up in your head, just pray for them. Just, Lord, bless them, whatever they're going through, be with them. Be going through a hard time. They just may need uh, just a quick prayer. But the Lord's listening. Now, before I end, I want to speak to those that are watching and listening that have heard this message and now you're at a, you find yourself at a crossroad and you're asking yourself, all right, well, I heard this message and I heard, you know, everything that you've had to say, but how can I receive this promise? How can I receive this promise of forgiveness and grace and peace? I'll tell you right now, you can receive it by coming to the cross and asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of all your sins. And if that's what you'd like to do, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Those of you that here that haven't done so or want to rededicate your life, you can repeat the same prayer, but it has to be done with all sincerity, with all your heart. Again, the Lord knows the reasons and purpose. You're praying to receive Him or you're, what you're praying for, and He does. He wants that broken heart. He wants to cleanse and fix that broken heart. So I ask you right now, wherever you're at, close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And now I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. I now believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead three days later. later. At this very moment now, I, I turn, I repent of my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I'll ask you right now to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and comfort me and show me more about God's grace and love and peace, so that I may grow as a Christian, grow more into the likeness of Jesus. Thank you again for forgiving me. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.